Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to probe further into the world of recursion. All the functions we've been looking at so far have always dealt with a single return value. Today we are going to be taking a look at how we can return multiple values from a recursive function. This is something we want to know how to do as it comes in handy time and time again. The whole idea behind returning more than one return value from a function is that we want to be able to capture or compute more than one thing inside a function and return it as an output. For example, the min max function below sorts the two numbers a and b by returning both the minimum and the maximum. There are multiple methods for how you can actually return multiple values in a programming language, the pseudocode below returns a comma separated list of return values, but not all languages offer this. Sometimes you need to return a list of values or create a wrapper object. However, returning multiple values is largely about being able to juggle around multiple variables within a function. So let's have a look at an example. In this simple problem, we're going to be finding the maximum element in a list. But instead of just finding the maximum element, we are also going to be returning the index of that maximum element. For example, the maximum element in this list should be 3 with an index of 2. Alright, now let's walk through how the maximum element and its index are actually found. The main idea is to run through all the elements and continuously update the best max index pair that we find. We're going to start on the left side of the list and work our way to the right. We'll begin by making a call to the find max function at index position 0 and move towards the end of the list. The find max function should take two arguments, the index of the current position as well as a reference to the list. We are going to keep on recursively calling the findMax function until we are out of bounds. Once we're out of bounds, we're going to return a value index pair containing the values null, comma, null to indicate that there is no best maximum or index yet. On the callback, we find that the value of 2 is better than a maximum value of null, so update the best value index pair to 2, 4. Since 2 is greater than negative 4, keep the best value index pair as 2, 4. Next, 3 is a greater max value than 2, so update the best value index pair to 3, 2. After that, 3 is still a better max value than 1, so keep the best value index pair as 3, 2. And similarly for the next position. In the end, we find that the maximum element is 3 with an index position of 2. The way we did that was by propagating the value index pair across recursive calls and comparing the current value to the best known value and updating accordingly. So the process of returning multiple values is really the same as returning a single value except that there's more variables and juggling of variables going on. Let's quickly take a look at some pseudocode on how to find the maximum element and its index. So the first thing I do is declare a function called findMaximumElement, which delegates the work of finding the maximum value and its index to the findMax function. All this function does is call the findMax function with a starting index of 0, as well as a reference to the list. Just like in the previous example, findMax takes i, the current index position, as the input, and lst, a reference to the list. Our base case is when we've reached the end of the list. In this case, return null, comma, null. Since there are multiple return values, we need to return null for each one. This is a good time to mention that if your programming language doesn't support returning a comma separated list of values, there are workarounds. One popular method is to return a list containing the index and the maximum value, Another strategy is to create a wrapper data class encapsulating the max value and its index, 
Personally, I tend to prefer creating a new data class if there's going to be a lot of information being returned, since that tends to keep the data more organized. After that, we get the best known maximum value and its index by calling the findMax function. If the best known maximum value is null, or the current value is better than the best known maximum, update the best max and best index. When the best known max is null, this means that there is no best maximum value yet, which is why we want to set the best maximum to the current value. After that, simply return best max and best index as the return values. All right, so like I've been doing in the other videos, I have a mini coding challenge for you guys. So we just looked at how to find the maximum element and its associated index in a one dimensional list. Now, the challenge I have for you guys is to implement a recursive function called find matrix max, which finds the row column index position of the largest element in the matrix. You can assume that the input matrix is a 2D array of rectangular proportions. I'm going to be walking through the solution in the slides to come, so feel free to pause the video here and give it a try. Awesome, I hope you all had a chance to give the challenge a try. Let's look at one way to solve this problem. So here on the screen I have a 2D matrix with six cells. The way we're going to approach solving this problem is by keeping track of the maximum value by traversing the matrix left to right, row by row, starting at index position 00. zero. On the right, I will be keeping track of the recursive function calls to the matrix max function, which takes three arguments, the row index position, the column position, and m, a reference to the matrix. The first function call to the matrix max function is the row column position 00, zero to kickstart the recursion. Then we begin traversing to the right, incrementing the column position as we go. Eventually the column position goes out of bounds. This indicates that we should go down to the next row. So we go down to the next row and reset the column position to 0. And then we keep incrementing the column index one position at a time. Then we're outside the bounds of the matrix again, which means we should go down to the next row. Now the recursion continues down to the next row, at which point we realize that the next row is also outside the bounds of the matrix. This is our base case that indicates that we should stop the recursion. When the row position is outside the bounds of the matrix, return null comma null to indicate that there is no best maximum element yet. Returning up the stack to the last position where we were, since this is also an empty cell, propagate the best known answer, which is currently still null comma null. Since seven is a better max value than null, update the best row column position to one comma two. Next, three is less than seven, so we propagate the row column position for cell seven. Now, eight is a better maximum value than seven, so update the best row column position to cell one comma zero. If the cell is empty, propagate the best known answer. Since six is less than eight, also propagate the best known answer. Now, Nine is greater than eight, so we update the best row column position to cell nine, which is zero comma one. One is less than nine, so propagate the best known row column position. In the end, we get that the maximum element is at the row column position zero comma one, corresponding to cell nine. Okay, let's have a look at some pseudocode on how one would implement the find matrix max function. You'll notice that it resembles the one-dimensional array example in many ways, except that we are now dealing with changing rows. First off, we declare the find matrix max function. This calls the internal function matrix max, which kickstarts our recursion by setting the row column position to zero, zero. Inside the matrix max function, we have two cases we handle. 
The first one checks if the row position is equal to the number of rows in the matrix and returns null. If we were to visualize what this means, it essentially tests for the case when we are outside the bounds of the rectangle from below. Returning null column and null represents that there is no best known row column index yet. The second if statement checks if we're outside the bounds of the matrix but on the right. When this happens, we want to move down to the next row. If we were to visualize this, anytime we were to land in a cell highlighted in yellow, we would move to the cell on the row down to the left, resetting the column position to zero. For example, if we were at position zero comma three, this would move us to the cell one comma zero. And if we were at cell one comma three, we would go to cell two comma zero. This is essentially what allows us to wrap around and go down to the next row. After those base cases are handled, we call the matrix max function to get the max row and max column indices. By default, we want to be moving cells from left to right, which is why when we recursively call the matrix max function, the row position stays the same, but we increment the column by one to move to the right. On the callback, after the matrix max function returns, this is where we want to actually find the index of the maximum element in the matrix. If the returned max row, max column values are null, this means there is no best cell yet. So we want to set the best row and the best column position to the current row column position. After that, here's where the more important update happens. If the value in the current cell is greater than the best known value, update max row and max column to the current cell. And the final step is just to return the max row and the max column values. All right, guys, and that's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for sticking around till the end. Please like this video and subscribe if you learned something, and I will catch you in the next one. Cheers.